Good morning. Sorry my voice is kind of gravelly today. It's allergy season. Before I discovered the power of antihistamines, I would have to like be sent home from school because my allergies were so bad. I couldn't even like see the board or like what I was supposed to be working on because I was crying so much. And you know what? Zyrtec used to be my go-to, but she doesn't cut it for me anymore. I go Allegra all the way now. That's not what this video is about at all. This video is about the Loveland Frogmen from Ohio. Of course. I'm just kidding. It's not really about that, but that's what I'm going to be drawing because I learned recently that the Ohio encrypted is a little anthropomorphic amphibian, which I personally love because I am a gigantic fan of Frog and Toad. They're so influential to like who I am today, especially like in my fashion sense. Anyway, let's get on with the video. I keep getting these ads on Hulu of Kristen Bell being like, oh my gosh, like, I don't think there should be any stigma around mental illness and like the fact that you have to take medication for your anxiety or your depression or blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that is so good for you, Kristen. And I felt a similar way until I was like, hold on, kind of feel like I should be ashamed. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. But like, sometimes I feel like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually, I'm actually, I'll leave you wondering what I was gonna say, <laughs> and instead I'll go into, like, the fact that there are many moments that I don't think that I am real. Like, every couple of months you just have to sit in front of the mirror and, like, like, wonder, wow, who is that? And then sit at your desk, and then you have to, you know, rip out a piece of binder paper from your high school English notebook and then write like a hundred different times just your name over and over again and wonder why it is that your right hand is your dominant hand. And I think this is part of the reason that Zoom school was so much easier for me than in-person school ever has or will be. I can see my little avatar and look, she's just like a little video game character along with all the other video game characters. It's like my subconscious just really leaned into the idea that we're living in a simulation. Because, you know what they say, either we're living in a simulation or Descartes was out of his mind. <laughs> yeah, obviously nobody says that. So Descartes was the guy that said, I think, therefore I am. He's also the guy who came up with the Cartesian coordinates after, like, staring at a fly on a ceiling. So he had a lot of ideas. Let me quickly look up how long ago he lived. Okay, yeah, so I knew that he lived a long time ago, but this is seriously a long time ago. Like, why did he have so much f time on his hands or was his concern about natural selection why wasn't he worried about disease or like trying to get some feelings So he said, I think therefore I am. Very briefly, here's what Descartes meant. He was honestly kind of paranoid about the possibility that our or his perceived reality was not the reality at all. We could all be living in a simulation or a dream and be none the wiser. Um, so he was like, okay, what can I know for a fact exists? And there was only one thing beyond a shadow of a doubt that existed. And that was his consciousness, but specifically his ability to reflect upon his consciousness. He thought, therefore he was. Whenever I hear people summarize his argument like this, I just feel like it's such a waste because how are you going to say all that and not mention Descartes' evil demon? The most relatable thing that Descartes ever did was think that there was an evil doubt maker out to get him. He's just like me for real. Things be looking a little too good and suddenly it's all, there must be a dark omnipotent force watching me and manipulating what I perceive as reality. Like go outside. <laughs> At least he had that one thing, you know, the awareness of his own thinking. But that leads to the problem of other minds because my hateful little demon can manipulate what I perceive and think and it's only through the action of me thinking about thinking that I know that I exist. But you? I can't metacognitively understand you. How do I know you're real? What if Descartes himself is a figment of my imagination? What if he's simply how my brain is processing the presence of somebody else from my actual reality like trying to wake me up or something? I'd like to introduce you now to my number one ride or die website, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I use this so much, I use it for every single class because it, it gives a better understanding of the broader concepts that inform different topics in philosophy classes. Like I used it a lot for my Aristotle class, which was actually kind of ridiculous because I felt like I wasn't learning anything in that lecture, even though it was three hours long and then I would go on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and I would read through the sources to try and find some sort of supplemental text to help me understand it. And you know who was listed? My own professor was listed in the citations. I was like, 
Okay, buddy. That's great. Good for you. Terrible for me. But anyway, the reason I'm bringing it up is because this problem on other minds has a very long entry on SCP, but I'm only going to read it's just the introduction. It says, Textbooks in philosophy often refer to the problem of other minds. At a superficial glance, it can look as if there is agreement about what the problem is and how we might address it. But on closer inspection, one finds there's little agreement about the problem or even the solution to it. Basically, before I continue, I needed you to know that I'm leaving out a lot of information on the history of this inquiry because it's boring. It's boring. And I've already written so many essays on all these silly old men being insane and delusional in a way that honestly should be strictly reserved for women. But the key conclusion is that in order for me to accept that your mind exists and vice versa, we have to trust that what we perceive of each other's behavior is enough to infer that we have minds. Like the fact that you and I can have a conversation should be enough to indicate to me that you have a mind, right? But what if we refuse? The thing is, I can't prove that you're real using any of the metrics that have been concretely established. You, individual that's watching this video and- oh, oh my goodness, leaving a like? Thank you so much! Aren't real to me in the same sense that I'm real to me. Fair enough. It goes both ways. How are you gonna prove that I'm real? I'm a fucking cryptid. My entire presence is being filtered through an evil demon manipulating your entire reality. You. Are. That guy getting gaslit in season 2 episode 2 of BBC Sherlock and I am that dog. <laughs> but yeah, basically, I think therefore I am. I cannot think therefore you are, is what I'm trying to say. But so what? We're just gonna rely on pseudoscience and faith? If I believe in you, will you believe in me? Please, it's like, as much as I can't prove that anything in my reality exists, there's no way that I can even assume the presence of an evil doubt maker. You know? Like, cause what difference does it make? If I can't find a way out of the matrix, then I might as well keep living in it. I can't prove Ryuk over here is real. We'd just be going in circles talking about dreams and hallucinations. So, we're gonna put that whole doubt maker aside and assume that we can know things about reality. If that's the case, how do we end up at truth? Or at the very least, belief? I think you know where I'm going with this. It's induction versus deduction, baby. <laughs> oh my god, it's such an annoying topic, but I love it so much. Like the philosophy of science is actually such a sleigh of a discipline and nothing else has made me quite as frustrated. Again, take what I'm saying as a cute little reductive cartoon version of the absolute tank of literature that exists on scientific reasoning. But induction and deduction are two different types of arguments or two different ways that we come to a conclusion. Induction is like saying every F has been G in the past, therefore the next F will be G or every F is G. So let's say every single cat that has been observed thus far has been pink. So every F the cat has been G, pink, or had quality G, pinkness, right? Then I would be the type of person to be like, oh yeah, cats are pink, because every single cat that I've seen is pink. So because all of my past experiences of cats being pink, the next cat that I see will be pink, therefore every cat is pink. Deduction is like top-down reasoning. You might have heard this very famous syllogism, Socrates is a man, men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. If you're gonna put the same conclusion drawn from an inductive argument, it would have to be based on every past instance of Socrates, he has been mortal. Therefore, in the next instance of Socrates, he will be mortal again. It's kind of a weird argument because you would never say that. Like, <laughs> like maybe you would know all men are mortal from inductive reasoning, but you wouldn't really know the conclusion through inductive reasoning, right? So let's say conversely, how do I put the pink cat argument into a deductive argument? We'll say, what if the premise was all felines are pink, cats are felines, therefore all cats are pink. So if the premises are true, the conclusion is necessarily true in a deductive argument. It's like the unproblematic argument. It's much simpler to accept than induction because using induction causes a lot of problems. Not using induction causes even more problems because we use it in everyday life. The pink cat example was like intentionally unrealistic, but it's something that we use in everyday life in terms of our understanding of what things are definitively as well as what things will be potentially. So there was this guy named Carl, spelled with a K, who was like, fuck induction, which is kind of silly given what I've just told you, but he was also real for that. I completely respect his decision to try and restructure the entirety of the scientific method without induction because there's this guy, his name was Nelson, and he really made it his mission 
to ruin induction for everybody. And he was so successful. Induction is ruined. Like, if you Google the new riddle of induction, like, you'll just see. Nelson was kind of like, he was after everybody's throats with that and he was successful and I gotta give it to him, but I also have to give it to Carl Raymond Popper for being like, let me try and find a solution. He wasn't successful, of course, but he did try. Like, he outlines his whole theory in this book, The Logic of Scientific Discovery. I've read it. Yeah, I give it a 6 out of 10 because he really almost did something for me. And, you know, philosophy of science as a discipline, but not quite. It at least gets, <laughs> at least gets the hamster wheel spinning up there, you know? But with a purely deductive system of scientific reasoning, the only things that can be known for sure are eliminative. So if I claim that all cats are pink and then we find a blue cat, the statement that we know is not all cats are pink. We do not know all cats are pink or blue. You see, like, because then what if we find a purple cat? Then we know not all cats are pink or blue. Not all cats are pink, not all cats are blue. My hypothesis is that if Karl Popper had a little more imagination and like a decent amount more whimsy, he would have made an excellent cryptozoologist. By his standards, you can never prove that Bigfoot doesn't exist. Yeah, you can reasonably assume that it doesn't, but can you prove it? No, you can't say, we have proven that Bigfoot doesn't exist because we have never found substantial evidence of its existence. Cause then you just improv a little yet on the back end of that sentence and we are fully back in business. Oh, dragons were never real because we haven't found a fossil of them yet. And they would have to be quadrupeds because of literally all of evolutionary research so far. And it would be impossible for something of that size and structure to fly. Mm, okay. Like, so even though Carl might have the same problem that I'm having about not being able to fully prove the existence of a- I'm- not gonna take personal claim of that problem, hold on. So I kind of see Descartes and Carl, <laughs> the way that I'm like <laughs> respectfully calling Descartes by his last name. Okay, I kind of see Rene and Carl on opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of what they would believe. Carl would say, I can't ever know for a fact that you don't exist. While Descartes would say, I will never know for a fact that you do exist. But in both cases, isn't it more beneficial to just believe in each other? <laughs> like, it's much better for me to imagine that you're real. It's so much more comforting than being alone. Same thing with aliens, I think. 15 minutes later, and we are right back at the beginning, like, hopefully when you started this video, you didn't have any doubts about your own existence or, like, my existence, you know, but... I just think it's interesting to think about these two different sides of the spectrum in terms of how we perceive our reality and come to conclusions about it, you know? Like this video if you are a real person and subscribe if you think that I'm a real person, okay? Uh, oh, and leave a comment if you want me to talk about how annoying this motherfucker Nelson was. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Yeah.